Hello ladies and gentlemen, hello to the chicas and to the chicos. We are back at you with uh, a video that I am going to chuck into the Amateur's Mind uh, subcategory, although this is a bit of a stretch because my opponent here is a 25-45 rated dude in Blitz. In fact, at this point in time he actually outrates me as you can see my rating in the bottom, but nonetheless the game featured a lot of things that I really wanted to make a video about, mostly because I think that uh, it would speak to a lot of players way below this uh, rating level. And so uh, I recommend that we jump right first head in into the deep end of uh, the water, the water that was muddled up by the Knight of Variation or the Bishop C4 Scheveningen. And here we encounter a typical uh, scenario, um, actually... No, I don't want now the lines. Um, let's talk about this a little bit because it's a very interesting structure that occurs a lot in the Sicilian. So white plays f5 and with the aid of the bishop on a2, he undermines the pawn on e6 and so I am forced to push. Now the push means that now I have got a very, oh, English is hard, a very weak d5 square. And I really need to make sure that now I trade my minor pieces in a way that there will be no outpost for a potential white piece to jump in here. And so the first and foremost uh, business for black uh, to conduct here is to disallow this trade. Now I very heavily overreacted this by playing e uh, h6 here, denying bishop g5 altogether, when in fact castles bishop g5 and knight e8, a motive that will come back later, would have been perfectly sufficient. So the irony is, is that we don't want to allow the bishop for knight trade, we want to trade off this bishop here, so that after knight e8 take take, I can jump back to uh, f6, monitoring um, the d5 square, and in this case, if I now show you lines, you will realize that this is dead even. But, I failed to recognize this, and in fact, I failed to recognize this even later on in the game, and so I went h6, denying the uh, bishop g5 move, and then I played here rook c8 to also deny knight d5 by virtue of hanging the pawn, and then he played bishop f2 here, and this caused me quite a bit of headache, because um, at this point I realized that bishop h4 was incoming with the previously mentioned trade. And then I realized that if I could uh, then move, jump the knight away somewhere, then I could still trade the, uh, uh, the bishops instead of the knight and be happy. So I castled here and somewhat carelessly I played knight g4, um, not realizing that this was actually a big mistake. I needed to go back to e8 contradicting my own my own rule of never go backwards in chess because the problem is that uh, is the fact that the knight on g4 is actually very exposed and he black can uh, sorry white can choose to hunt the knight rather than the bishop and so just like in the game after bishop takes bishop they take the knight not the bishop thus now achieving their dream that they have got two pieces left uh, being able to attack d5 and I've got only one defender on it, so things are looking rather glum. Bishop went back to f6 and he immediately jumped into d5, once again doing the most logical thing, um, and that is to trade the white squared bishops, so that we can end up in a dream scenario from white point, white's point of view, which is the ultimate good knight, uh, bad bishop story. Um, and the, it, this is a really, really unpleasant story from my point of view, because this knight is basically covering all important juicy squares, and my bishop is an overgrown pawn. This is a strategically lost position from white's point of view, and I already knew that this was what was waiting for me here. Once again, my mistake here was, well, I made two mistakes here. One was that I didn't realize that right now the only threat that white has is that they want to take and after take play knight d5 with a tempo on the bishop. And so if I had noticed this, I would have played the king h7. And so the idea is that after take, take knight d5 doesn't work because I can just take here, unlike in the game or unlike in my calculations rather. And the take is useless, so I just take back because I'm no longer pinned. So this would have kept the game in a very normal uh, on a very normal path, but here I panicked because I was already visioning this trade of the bishop scenario 
and then uh, the knight coming to d5 and I'm dead and I was all doom and gloom about this, but in a proactive way. And although what I've done here is actually unsound um, by the engine's measure, I think that from a human's point of view, it's a very, very instruct instructive way to play because there is also a trend here and people seem to be very reluctant to recognize trends, not reluctant, but simply lacking the ability really to recognize trends in their games. The trend here is, is that I'm getting gradually outplayed positionally. And if the game follows this trend, I'm going to end up in a position as per described where I just can't move a muscle. This knight dominates the board here. White can choose which side they want and want to kill me or uh, kill me in, whether it be queen side by a4 or on the king side by some rook lift attacks. Quite frankly, both look quite uh, dangerous. And I'm sitting here in hopeless passivity. So this is the trend, and I did recognize this. And usually, what you want to do is to stop the trend at all cost. And when I say at all cost, I mean if material needs to be given up, that's the least that you should consider, un consider under the label or cost. And so here I devised a plan that was based on the idea of sacking an exchange and altogether changing the character of the game. And that is basically the best way, in my opinion, to stop a trend, because it's very easy to say that, oh yeah, this is a downward trend, but to actually actively do something and blast that trend apart and change its direction entirely is easier said than done. Now, here is how I, what I did. I went queen b6. I got a question mark, exclaim mark um, for it. I will actually now cover up the lines because what I think I'm showing you is far more important than the actual evaluation. He took, and I went rook takes c3. And that was the whole concept, that I wanted to check second exchange. And let's see what we get out of this. He takes back, pretty much forced, I take the bishop. So now the following things have happened. First, I am an exchange down. That's the negative side. On the positive side, however, let's go one by one. We have destroyed their pawn structure on the queen side, which now consists of three isolated pawns. All of them should be juicy targets. Two, he doesn't have a positional grind on me anymore. The character of the game has dramatically changed. It's not going to be a positional squeeze based on him having the best knight of chess history in my face on d5. And three, unlike in any other scenario that would have occurred after the knight on d5, now, I have got realistic activity. In fact, because of his two next very poor moves, I'm going to be dictating the tempo of the game, which is just unheard of in a scenario where I take this. Here, I'm not going to dictate anything at all until we shake hands at the end of the game. Now, even if I lose this game, I will have a shot at it. And very typically, when the trend changes in a game of chess, it's very typical that as soon as the trend stops, they make a mistake. And that's exactly what happened here. Because he white needed to realize that now having the two rooks uh, and the inferior pawn structure, oopsies, I didn't mean to show that, what he needed to do was to open up the position. And so for that reason, one of my favorite moves for white here is this brilliant c4 pawn thrust with the idea of instantly jettisoning a pawn for the sake of opening up a file for the white rook. And now this rook comes here, I defend this pawn one way or another, and then the other rook comes here, and you realize that after all the trend hasn't changed much. My pieces are still rather passive, and white is doing really, really well with the rooks directed down onto a weakness and onto the open file. That would have been my favorite way to play for white. Instead, my opponent, he started playing very suboptimal moves. First, he went back to e2, which is rather mysterious, although I understood instantly that he was hoping to play for a4. I'm like, cool, I played rook c8. I'm like, come at me, I'm hanging c3. And he played queen d3. And now you realize that from the trend breaker, rook takes c3, since then, he has played two moves, queen back, queen here, which virtually hasn't done a single thing in white's position 
to improve the situation. In the interim, my rook traveled from here to here, thus becoming the best piece on the board. Now I am attacking this guy, I'm attacking that guy. I don't care about d6, I would be more than happy to trade d6 for e4 and potentially the c pawns. He goes rook e1, defending the weakness, but now I'm piling up on c3. And again, I have to stop. I can't emphasize this enough because a lot of club level players would be absolutely shaken by the fact that if they were told that their best chance was to take this. And so I highly recommend you to try to play a game starting from here where you take this and you are black and see how you travel against the lower level engine or do this the same from this position again against a lower level engine. First of all, it's a lot easier to play this one. Second of all, it's a lot more fun to play. And third of all, it's a lot harder to play for white, which is also a crucial difference. And from here on, it's a steady downhill for white where he plays constantly inferior moves all the way. He offers a queen trade. I gladly, gladly accept this part of being down because I recognize here a supremely important fact about this position, which is, is that there is zero open files on the board. That means that the rooks for the time being are utterly useless. So my bishop rook combo actually way outsmart the two rooks because the two rooks have nowhere to go. I take, and here again, I noticed instantly as soon as I played it, that right now I don't have a threat as black because I don't want to take this. And again, it's so paradoxical to think about it at first, but as soon as you look at takes and you realize that um, after takes rook c1, rook takes, rook takes, this rook is coming in, attacking all these pawns, black is dead lost. And this is the time when I am the largest amount of material ahead from Black's point of view, or the least amount behind, if you will. And yet, that's the cleanest loss so far we have had, which is a testament to how much this whole concept is not about uh, regaining material, but to retain initiative. And you have to be very careful about how you use your initiative, because taking one pawn is fine, but taking the second would be a terrible mistake. And in fact, in this position, white's best is rook e4, with the idea of a4, again, activating both rooks. The game continued with a4, which is obviously a fail, because now, again, after b4, I get to keep the position closed. Good news. He plays a5, which I thought was a good move, because if he had played anything else, I would have played next a5, again, completely blocking up everything and allowing myself to bring the bishop in and then bring my king in as well, pretty much as per game. Now, to be fair, after a5, uh, a5 here, I missed the win with e4. I did look at this move, but I couldn't evaluate it with the very little time I had, and I was reluctant, to be honest, and that's a very big mistake here to give up material for initiative, but I should have, because in the subsequent catches, um, black is doing splendidly well. The b-pawn is an absolute menace. Like I'm almost minus three up here. You guys don't see that evaluation bar quite. Why not, I wonder? Actually, I can widen that, can't I? There you go. You can see it now. And so I should have done it, but unfortunately I didn't. Um, I here opted for what positionally appeared to be the most logical thing to do, and that was to read out the bishop here, thus creating an absolutely impregnable uh, and unpenetrable uh, barrier or wall. But this was a mistake. He played rook e2, which of course was another mistake. Note how insanely passively he's playing the position. The rooks never really have a chance, and now I managed to achieve everything I wanted. Perfect bishop, perfect rook, and the plan is ready to go. G3, I hunted down the pawn, and essentially the game is over here. The rest requires very, very little commentary. Um, 
ironically, I did lose this game, by the way, on time. But um, Black had no, sorry, White had no chance whatsoever to achieve anything on the board. Once again, now they managed to open up one file, but it's way too late because now my king is coming up and I've got too many pawns and there will be more to come. So I just bring up the king and I start now hurting f5. He defends it, but in the process he loses even more. And unfortunately, tragically here, I didn't realize how little time I had left. And uh, I lost on time in a couple of more moves. But the moral of the story is, is that when you are facing a very, very unpleasant trend, and you realize that you are facing a very ugly positional pressure, it's a very good idea to change the character of the game. Once that happens, and uh, you achieve that, then your objective is to really make sure that you retain that initiative and you try to uh, build it up and up and up and as best as you can and see how far you can go with that. Equally importantly, if it happens to you on the receiving end, it's very important to instantly readjust to the new conditions and recognize how the position has changed. So what White failed here to do was to realize that, okay, I'm going to exchange up, but the fact that I'm material up is the least relevant factor or feature rather of the position. What I really need to be aware of here as white is I have the two rocks. I need files. Opening files. And that means that we need to trade some pawns and force them to move away. And so my favorite move is C4. The engine's favorite is Rook FT1, which I can totally relate to as well. Um, and if queen d7, then c4. The idea is the same. You chuck away a pawn and you activate your pieces. And this way, I would have failed to turn the trend around entirely. The character of the position is still a little bit messier than it would have been with the knight on d5. But um, yeah, I wouldn't have quite achieved full compensation, unlike I did in the game, where once this endgame occurred, my opponent went down so, so quickly. So, the moral of the story is don't forget to recognize trends. And when the trends change in your position, you need to take a deep breath and instantly start thinking with a new, fresh head. Thinking, okay, let's see what has changed. How do I need to adapt to this? Because my opponent has not adapted at all. So he just kept on playing positional chess, supposedly, which landed him in a position where his two rooks never had a go at all. So for the rest of the game, the two rooks have uh, remained utterly useless. They just could not achieve a thing. And by the time there was an open file on the board on the A file, I took like seven pawns. So yeah. Like at this moment, right here, right now, I've got six pawns versus his two. But even here, five versus his two, the game is uh, over black wins. So that was it for today, guys. By the way, this happened um, on stream. Um, although obviously I'm doing a post analysis. And uh, please check out my stream whenever you can. Uh, I would love to see you there as well. Thanks for watching. I will be back with more soon. Bye.